conspiracy or something like that was sent home for six weeks to recover. And then a ferret changed my whole life. A ferret. <laughs> asking a boy what imagination was. He paused for a while and his companions tried to answer. One said it is a dream world. Another said it's something you make up that isn't there at all. But the boy who had been silent suddenly said, imagination is your eye looking in instead of out. And that's as fine a definition as you can find. For decades now, children of the Listowel area of North Kerry have looked inside themselves for those hidden depths of imagination, thanks largely to the legacy of this man, Brian McMahon, national school teacher, poet, playwright, author, collector of folklore and ballads, and passionate lover of the Irish language. To hundreds of people whose children now have children of their own, he is still affectionately remembered as the man who instilled in them a love of nature, heritage, and storytelling the master. The first hair came to Ireland. Now here's a lovely little animal. His it's mother, beautiful. Joanna, who had been a headmistress in Lancashire in England, returned to Ireland in 1908 to marry law clerk Patrick McMahon in Listowel. The happy marriage was founded in disparate backgrounds. She, a cosmopolitan, an ardent believer in extrasensory perception and user of a Ouija board, he, a man rooted in tradition and custom, and an apostle of the Irish language movement. They would have three boys and a girl. Brian Michael arrived in the world on the 29th of September, 1909. She was a schoolmistress and she, she had a first job outside the town, a little place called Clown Matton. Every morning it was my task to tackle the little black donkey, put him under this little trap, and the bells ringing would go off for the school. St. Michael's College in Listowel was the next move after national school, and there the academic and literature lover Seamus Wilmot encouraged Brian's essay writing. All this, however, against the background of the War of Independence and the subsequent Civil War. He had, he had a baiting society, and this was in the, in the turmoil of the Civil War, and the class was divided. Now, don't forget, there was one of the fellows was, was in a column all through the trouble, and he sat near the window. You understand, he watched the gate to see where the tans coming up. And one day when the tans lorry stopped at the gate, he ran over the desk and he dropped a revolver on his way out. And they calmly put it up and said, you dropped something. Some of the fellas had, 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 had grenades in their pockets. You know, it was a... And some of them went left the class and became officers in the Free State Army and went up and, and fought with their fellas that were bombed the scene and raid with us. It was an extraordinary position. But... Uh, all through this, Seamus Wilmer kept our head with a debating society. Now, you're Labour. Your father is Labour. Now, you're coming on rail because your father is in... Yeah. And you're so-and-so. We argued it out at the top of our voices and never took offence. So he defused it. If Brian had had his way, he would have joined the civil service of India, a country looking with interest at Ireland's newfound independence. But Joanna McMahon had other ideas. Her son would follow her into the teaching profession. She would broach no argument. It was a Dublin still licking its battle wounds that awaited Brian McMahon. After teacher training at St. Patrick's College, he worked at a school in Donore Avenue for 18 months. But then... Two things altered my whole career. I stood in the queue on a winter's night for Jimmy O'D and got pneumonia or pleurisy or something like that. was sent home for six weeks to recover. And then a ferret changed my whole life, a ferret. 
I was walking down the street one day when I saw a friend of mine, he was a dentist afterwards, with a little ferret in a box, and he said, we'll go ferreting. All right, I said. Down we went, and we were passing the presbytery, when the curate came out and says, have you got a ferret in the box? And we said, we have. And they said, bring it in, because we've got rats. And you're going to put it into that hole in the garden and to out rats. Now, the, the ferret lid up. We couldn't get him out. And I looked through the window, and I saw him crawling along the, way, the wainscot, you know? And there was the old cannon inside with his beretta with the purple tassel on top of it. And here was the ferret right behind it. And beyond that was the vague figure of a woman, which I didn't recognize. Here was I on leave from my post in Dublin, and I walked in to recover my ferret. The cannon was half asleep, but my hand I took the ferret and I said, you'll give him the school, so will your cannon. My mother was inside, there was a job here for me. I said, I want no school. I'm, I'm at school in Dublin, I'm going to go to the university. You'll give him the school, so cannon, will you? I'll give him the school, he says. And I came out and I said, what are you other doing to me? And she said, you've got a job in the town. I said, I don't want a job in the town. I have a job in Dublin. I want to live in a city. You're staying here now. So you have sense for yourself. You'll do better here. You'll only burn yourself out in Dublin. Get here. And, do. and so I became a, a, a small fish in a small pool to some extent. These things altered my life. Jimmy O'Dee and a ferret. But the fish grew considerably. Encouraged by social historian Seamus Delargy, Brian used his spare time to gather folklore, cycling from county to county to learn local customs and record differing dialects. Travelling people also fascinated Brian McMahon, so much so that he became an expert on their secret language, shelter or sheldru, and encouraged them to take formal education. They used to always come in, they used to sleep in the market sometimes, they would take over the market when it was a quiet time. And they'd always come to us for water, so I knew them always. And then I realized they had a secret language, so I learned this secret language. Now, it's not a, it's not a wonderful thing, but it's a mixture of backgammon and Irish, and, and there are Latin clues in it. There's a whole lot of things written on it. I learned that, and I sat at the bonfires, and I, I got, a, I got a, a tape, not a tape recorder, I got a wire recorder, and I recorded what they had to say, and then analyzed it. And then, I went up to the west of Ireland and said I was a Kerry Brian, which I am a Kerry Brian, but they thought I was a Kerry O'Brien because they often refer to O'Briens as Brian's. So then I got their confidence. And then I, I learned it bit by bit because it was there. Then the children, I, I welcomed them into in the school. Now they were wonderful kids. They were wonderful, wonderful kids in their way, but they posed problems. And I'm not saying the life of the travelling people of Tinker a tenor or whatever you call them, and not saying it's an uh, idyllic life. It's a rough, tough life. Every day giving you the giving you the problem of living, living in your wits and that kind of thing. So it's not idyllic. But uh, eventually I, I, I got um, I got their confidence to some extent. I kept their brought their letters for them and did that kind of thing and I got to be friendly with them. And I wrote a <coughs> good play about them called The Honey Spike. The Honey Spike, about the characters and incidents encountered by a young travelling couple journeying around Ireland, is depicted in this copper by fellow school teacher Tony O'Callaghan, presented to Brian when he retired from teaching. You'd meet him at Puck Fair and they say, you say, Tony in your own talk and so and he dished him a and I went into your jills, which means talk in your own talk and the fool here won't know what you're saying, you see? And there you were in then, you know. I often try, I tried them out in this thing and they were always looking for money. So, but I said, one, one, one of them came to me in Puck one time and he asked me for something. Gorgas and Yumpa, give us a pound. And I said, I'm broken, that I may be corrupted, I haven't a tonic in my go that I may be killed, I haven't a halfpenny in my pocket. He said, you're shot, master. Well, I am, I said. He put his hand in the says and brought her all and she gave me a couple of pounds. I thought this was a lovely, you know, a slant of their lives and that kind of thing. But... Uh, I knew them all. They were some of them very lovely people, very lovely people. The cultures and wisdoms of the settled communities and the travellers, allied to North Kerry's rich folklore, would continue to inspire Brian McMahon's prolific writing. As with so many writers in North Kerry, that enthusiasm to put words on paper was fuelled here in this shop in Listowel, owned then by the legendary Dan Flavin, run today by his son Jack. He lived for books. He lived for books. He was a flower and mail shop. 
before his yeah. hand. Yeah, he no, made that a bookshop. I often think there must have been a great war when he told his father and mother that he was no. putting in books. And <laughs> I said the about the time you were burned down. Yeah. And about he replaced it with books yeah. and gave us the run of the bookshop yeah. and, and educated us all. And the people who has come in here, you know, recall them, Jack, they're before your time. Well, let me have Lytton, Frank O'Connor. O'Connor. O'Connor, I think, wrote about your father, Dan, that he couldn't bear to sell a poor book and he couldn't part with a brilliant book. Oh, yes. yes, well, he was that. But he educated us all, gave us books and told us what to read and everything like that. Who else came Mac in here? McGreevy. Tom McGreevy from Paris, Mac telling Mac us Walsh. about... about Morris Walsh, of course. Yes, George Fitzmaurice. Yes, you said A.E. called A.E. Him, came it? here with nicotine stain, stained fingers. Your father yeah. remember that for me. The Blasket and, Islands uh, have always been a great influence on Brian McMahon, or more especially, the writers and folklorists they produced. Through their words, handed down from generation to generation, they furnished oral and written histories of communities and livelihoods which would otherwise have been buried with the last inhabitants. The queen of the folklorists was Peg Sayers, who was born in a small townland at Dunquin, overlooking the Blaskets. She was put into domestic service as a young girl, and then, at the age of 17, matched with a Blasket Island man. She outlived her husband, several of her children, and most of the people she set down in her autobiography in her old age. To Brian McMahon fell the honor of translating this precious manuscript from the Irish language into English adding further acclaim to his international reputation as a writer. His status in Ireland is exemplified when President Robinson, on a private visit to the area, breaks her itinerary to walk the clifftops with one of her favorite authors. She too has a love of Kerry's rich folklore and greatly admires Brian McMahon's labors to preserve it for future generations. He wrote many poems and short stories for the old Bell Literary Magazine under the guidance and with the encouragement of its editor, Sean O'Fwayloin, and the writer, Frank O'Connor. They before him had been influenced by Daniel Corkery. One day I was in Dublin doing the Atlas Kerryman, and I said, Mr. O'Connor, Mr. O'Fwayloin, how do you write a short story? And they said, one of them said to me, well, you get a male idea and a female idea, and you marry them, and the children are short stories. And I thought this was a joke. But when I examined it afterwards, I thought the most profound thing that was ever said to me, it was gold, because my life has been devoted ever since to the marriage of opposites. Marriage of opposites. Here I'm an opposite, here now I'm standing on the edge of the world, in a very pre prehistoric and prehistoric place. Next week I might be in, in a benign nuclear fission station in London, or I might be out in, out in the Canaries, or I might be in New York. So I have to reconcile these disparate. This peninsula evokes musical memories, too, of Sean O'Reilly and Kjoltori Hulan. It was they who provided the incidental music for Brian's play, Song of the Anvil, which was chosen by the Abbey for the International Theatre Festival of 1960. Oh, Sean O'Reilly was great. So uh, this play was in the Abbey, and it was getting very mysterious, and I think Rosendus Blythe said, that could do with a bit of music. Well, I said, uh, Sean O'Reilly had a, a lovely tuxedoed, uh, operatic, uh, nice, uh, classical, musical quartet there. I said, Sean, I want a different music. We're getting music. What do you want? He said, I said, I want the cream, the refinement of native music. He said, come with me to Galloping Green. He came to Galloping Green, and there they were all there, and I said, play. My God, I was transfixed. I said, I don't give a damn what my play does. This is magic. And it proved to be magic, because out of that came Kultori Kulin, and a whole lot of things called Tori Lion and all the revival of his music. That's how it came about. Let them say what they like about the Shelburne Hotel. That's where it began. Ronnie McShane, all these fellows, how to play the bones, the boron, and all that kind of thing. That's where it began. Sean O'Reilly was here. Oh, yes, he was here. He lived with Sean the Horror there. Sean the Horror was a traditional singer. He lived there for a long time, and I met him very often in this locality. He drew sustenance here, the same as we all draw sustenance from this locality. Brian has hammered on the anvil of imagination throughout his teaching and writing career, urging young and old to reach into their own depths to find worlds that would otherwise remain submerged, drowned by today's technological and undemanding entertainments and pastimes. For generations of secondary students, Brian's story, The Windows of Wonder, was the clear glass through which they could see a wider and greater world, 
I miss the idealism. There's no idealism. And I miss the, I, 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 I grumble at the passivity. They're passive people. They want fun made for them. Now, when I finished teaching 15, 16, 17 years ago, I went around to the schools of Ireland. One day I'd be in Templemore, another day I'd be in Dublin, then I'd be in Athlone and so forth. And I spoke to the leading surf boys and girls. And they always asked me this question. Any questions now? They always asked me the same question. I couldn't get over it. Mr. McMahon, do you ever get bored? What would I get bored for? I'm absolutely... God's sake, I, I, I'm hyper-stimulated. It's got you, I want a sensitive always. And they couldn't get over this, that you weren't bored. Because they're passive, because the box makes them, you know, passive and we'll entertain you. You'll be a good boy now, we'll entertain you. Sit down there and be soporific and we'll be good too. I, I think it's a joke. Somebody must re rekindle the flame of idealism in our people and then they will move forward to greatness. Kitty Ryan from Cashel in County Tipperary was the woman who shared more than half a century with the gregarious writer and gave him five sons. The couple met in the renowned matchmaking town of Listoon Varna in County Clare. Listoon Varna is synonymous with love, Lord, and people. And I did not know this, that I keep protesting to my dying day that it was just another town to me. And I was cycling through it and I said I'd stay there for the night at Sheedy's. And then I'd be gone in the morning. And I was going up to Galway and all these beautiful territories to the west. And uh, this Tipperary man said to me, I got to move in. And of course I went out with her and at Trinity Church I met my doom. <laughs> well, but I am, we had a good life. We had a good run of it, 55 years of it. Good run of it. Kitty passed away on the 5th of August, 1991, leaving Brian alone in the house in Church Street but a house filled with memories of a happy marriage. In the back room of that house, Brian still writes, as he's done now for three score years. Here sit quietly the ghosts of people real and imagined, but all immortalized through his descriptive skill. And bubbling to the surface of pages yellowing or new is his passion for Kerry's natural beauty and its people. In his book, Children of the Rainbow, one character said he considered it the duty of at least one old man in every generation to pass on the ferocity of this passion to youngsters. So much so that they wouldn't think they had been sons and daughters of the flesh, but children of the rainbow, dwelling always in the morning of the world. But there has been an even wider range to his creative talent. The writing of ballads, begun when collecting native Irish music for the RTE radio program, Ballad Makers Saturday Night, with the Listowel jobbing printer, Bob Cuthbertson, he produced his ballads in printed form. But, alas, others have since claimed them as their own. I got so pestered I was known as the ballad maker. And this didn't suit me at all because I wanted to be known as the short story writer, if you please. I have a lot of notions. But I made lots of these. I have lots of them there. I can get them here in the back room. And they began to gather momentum. And I hear them to the present day. With everybody's name to them except mine, <laughs> and it's extraordinary how they steal them. I saw a very elegant production from Radio Air recently on television where a person went down to the campus to, 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 to record the songs, the tribal songs of the Tinkers. And they sang my songs and said their grandfather made it. So what are you going to do? Or you say a ballad was made to be sung and be philosophical about it. I wrote a little ballad about my friends and the in the pack, which is called the Hounds of Gleno. This area is Gleno. And my friend Peggy Sweeney is a lovely artiste who interprets these songs, not merely my songs, but those of my friend, God rest him, Sean McCarthy. So I'd ask her, please, to sing the Hounds of Gleno. Hello. See by the horizon the ocean light shining the scale and scope of Brian's activities are enormous. He revived the art of the historical pageant in Ireland. Among those he wrote was the famous 1966 Croke Park commemoration of the 1916 Rising. He's a co-founder of the local drama group, a visiting lecturer on the continent of Europe and in the United States, a play adjudicator, co-founder of the internationally famous Listowel Writers' Week, and the man who introduced to Ireland the now widely accepted concept of the writer's workshop. 
by the departed strains of the hounds of Glenoe. The strength of Brian's character came to the fore when he campaigned for a new school to replace the old and crumbling building. So we pulled out kids. One of them was a grandnephew of Michael Collins. Another was a grand, uh, whose father had signed a treaty. Another man was descended from Thomas Ashe. We got all the thing. We got about six of these people. We got them to run through the puddles in the front of the school. We took their photographs. And we brought it up into the Minister of Education above. What was his name? Was he? he had been out in Easter week. Oh, Dick Mulcahy. And we got the chief for us, armed with representatives of the INTO. Miss Skinner, who was a 1916 woman, was president of the INTO. And eventually, when we were talking about a new school and that we were going to go on industrial action, I stepped forward, went up to the desk and said, Minister, I said, you see that child there? Yeah. His great granduncle fought with you in North County, Dublin, 1916. Do you see him? You do? Well, he's a grandnephew of Michael Collins who fought through all the time. Do you see him? Well, his, his grandfather signed the treaty with you, and they got nothing out of the revolution, only shame and degradation. He says, give him a new school. Brian finally resigned from teaching after 44 years at the Listowel School but his literary output shows no sign of decreasing. Well, this is a story about an old Tipperary farm wife. She's a widow, her husband, Martin. It is important to remember the word Martin. And uh, he's dead, and she's saving the hay with her son, Con, and his wife. And the narrator, a young fellow from, from Kerry, her grandson, is watching all this, and suddenly they realize that she has lost her wedding ring in the hay. And nothing will do her until she go down on her knees and search the hay, wisp by wisp, soft by soft, until she finds the hay, the ring, and the and the keeper. And of course, the whole work is held up. The strain goes on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and so the story comes in at the end like this. By Friday, the house was an edge. My uncle Con spoke guardedly to his mother at dinner time. This will set us back a great deal, mother, he said. I know, son, I know, son, I know, was all she said. Saturday came and the strain was unendurable. About three o'clock in the afternoon, she found the keeper. We loitered for a while in the darkness outside the ring of her lantern's light. But she resented our pitying eyes, so we went away in. We sat around the big fire waiting, Uncle Con, Aunt Annie, and I. That was the lonely waiting without speaking, just as if we were waiting for an old person to die or to, for a child to come into the world. Near twelve, we heard her step in the cobbles. It was typical of my grandmother that she placed a lantern on the ledger of dresser and quenched a candle in it before she spoke to us. I found it, she said. The words dropped out of her drawn face. Get hot milk for my mother, Annie, said Uncle Con briskly. My grandmother sat by the fire, a little to one side. Her face was as cold as death. I kept watching her like a hawk, but her eyes didn't even flicker. The wedding ring was inside its keeper, and my grandmother kept twirling it round and round with the fingers of her right hand. Suddenly, as if ashamed of her fingers' betrayal, she hid her hands under her check apron. Then, unpredictably, the fists under the apron came up to meet her face, and her face bent down to meet the fists in the apron. Oh, Martin, Martin, she sobbed, and then she cried like the rain. In 1973, President de Valera presented Brian with an honorary doctorate conferred by the National University of Ireland for his services to Irish literature. Twenty years later, Dr. Tony O'Reilly, on behalf of the America Ireland Fund, presented him with their literary award for lifetime achievement. Brian McMahon is one of the most anthologized of Ireland's authors and happily continues to open wide the windows of wonder. How would the master himself like to be remembered? I suppose that I was a schoolmaster who, who I, I used the phrase, I borrowed it, I think, who left the track of his teeth on the parish for three generations. I'd like to be remembered as a short story writer who had by passages into ballads and uh, novel, I suppose, and a play, but the short story is, a, is, a, is my medium.
That's my story for you. And if there's a lie in it, well, let it stand. Tomata prea gum piach.